In my last session, I used Facebook's most recent earnings report. Yes, that's the one, the one that caused all the reaction and which contained a lot of bad news. I used that to talk about corporate governance, not just at Facebook, but at young technology companies. In this one, I want to go back to that earnings report and focus on something more precise, but something that I think truly matters, which is how do accountants record items at Facebook and is it possible that inconsistencies in the way accountants approach, the way they expense things could affect what you see in the numbers. I'm gonna argue, and I'm giving away the end game here, that while Facebook's most recent earnings report was not good news by any means, it did contain bad news, it looked worse than it should because of the way accountants record items, especially at technology companies. So let me get the process rolling by thinking about what accounting is supposed to do. What, what's the role of accountants? I know accountants will disagree with me on this, but I think there are three big questions that I want accounting to answer. And I speak as somebody who's a user of accounting statements, not somebody who generates them. To me, accounting is raw material that I use in corporate finance and valuation. Here are the three big questions I'm looking for answers for in the accounting statements. First, I want to know what a business owns. What are the assets that it has? Tangible, intangible, I don't care. What are the investments the business has made? Second, I'd like to know how much the business owes. After all, as an equity investor, as the owner, I get whatever's left over. And third, I'd like to know how much money my business made in the period that the statement covers. The last year, the last quarter. How much do you, what do you own? How much do you owe? How much money did you make? I know this does not sound like an exciting list. And it looks like I'm relegating accounting to being recorders of history. And guess what? I think that is the primary role of accounting, is to tell me what happened or has happened at a business over time. Now, in answering these questions, accountants develop a bunch of financial statements. And I'm going to highlight the three most common. The first, of course, is the balance sheet, where an accountant records what a firm owns, what are the assets of the firm, as well as what it owes. And in that same balance sheet, it'll also tell you what accountants tell you your ownership stake or equity is worth. And there's the income statement, where the accountant tells you how much money the company or the business made during the period examined, measured through accounting eyes as accounting earnings. And then there's a statement of cash flows where accountants record cash in and out of the firm Categorized into three groups, operating cash flows, investing cash flows, and financing cash flows. And the end game of a statement of cash flows, though it seems to be explaining the change in the cash balance from period to period, is really about telling you what the cash earnings of your company was in the most recent period, as opposed to the accounting earnings. Those are the three big statements, but in developing these statements, accountants have to expense things and they have to decide which box to put an expense into. When you look at any expense that a company has, it can be put into one of three boxes and accountants are claimed to be religious about the way they put things into boxes. The first are operating expenses. These are expenses associated with creating the revenues you show during a period. So you're going to include the cost of producing the product that you sell or the service that you sell. And you also have related operating expenses, SG&A expenses, marketing expenses. So operating expenses are expenses that create this period's revenues. And you have financing expenses. These are expenses associated with the use of debt. Most commonly, you're going to see interest expenses, short-term and long-term debt. So you've got operating expenses, you've got financing expenses. The third grouping of expenses, which are capital expenses. What are capital expenses? I'll give you the definition my first accounting professor gave me. He said, capital expenses are any expenses that a business makes where the benefits are spread over many years. And he gave the example of a company building a factory. He said, you build a factory, it costs you money, but that cost is going to create benefits over many years because the factory is going to be in production for many years. So you've got operating expenses, you've got financing expenses, you've got capital expenses. You're saying, so what? Remember those three financial statements? The way these expenses show up will depend on how they're categorized. So let's start with the easy one. Operating expenses show up as cost of goods sold. 
and that's operating expenses. So basically, they're the expenses you net out from revenues to get to operating income. What happens with capital expenses? Capital expenses in the period that you make them don't actually show up in your income statement. They show up as an asset on your balance sheet. And then over the lifetime of the period that you expect to get benefits, if you build a factory you think is going to last 10 years, you depreciate or amortize that expense. And that depreciation or amortization shows up as part of the operating expenses to get to operating profit. So operating expenses show up in the year that you make them with capital expenses are spread out over time. Now, once you have the operating profit, financing expenses enter the game. Now, financing expenses show up in the balance sheet first as the borrowings that create those expenses. You show them as debt. And the financing expenses themselves show up as expenses below the operating profit that you subtract out to get to pre-tax profit on which you pay taxes and you get to net profit. You can already see that accounting has logic to it. If you break expenses down and you're systematic about how you do it, what do you see as profits for a company? What do you see on the balance sheet? And even what you see on the statement of cash flows will reflect the categorization of expenses. Now, when I took my first accounting class, I was told that accountants were religious about the way they categorize expenses. In the decades since, I've decided that was not quite the truth that accountants not just miscategorize expenses, they routinely miscategorize expenses and to degrees that they can make huge differences in what you see. So I'm going to look at two types of miscategorization. In the first, accountants miscategorize a financing expense as an operating expense. And we'll talk about hey, how that plays out in financial statements and what you can do to correct for that miscategorization. In other words, you wanted to reverse the accounting mistake. How would you do it and how is it going to show up? Then I'm going to talk about miscategorizing capital expenses as operating expenses and play you through that as well. But let's stay with miscategorizing financing expenses as operating expenses. I'm going to give you the most common example. Until 2019, if you had a lease expense, and you met certain criteria which were fairly easy to meet, accountants would categorize that lease expense as an operating lease expense. So if you were a, a retailer and you leased a store for the next 10 years, the lease expense each year was treated as an operating lease expense, and accountants let you treat that expense as an operating expense. Well, here's the reason lease expenses are not operating expenses. When you think about what a lease contract creates, it creates a contractual claim on you to pay a million dollars or two million dollars every year for the next 10 years. That is the essence of debt, a contractual claim. Leasing is just a different way of borrowing. That has always been true. Accountants in their hearts have known it, but until 2019, they allowed this loophole where operating lease expenses were treated as operating expenses. You're saying, so what? When you treat lease expenses as operating expenses, you, in a sense, you, you misstate operating income. Now, misstate in what sense? You're subtracting out an expense that should be below the line, below the operating income line, and move it above the line. But you have other consequences. Because you treat operating leases as operating expenses, you fail to bring in that lease commitment, the debt you've taken on at least implicitly when you sign that lease contract on the balance sheet. So when you treat operating leases or any financing expenses and operating expense, you misstate the operating income. You also misstate the book debt for the company. And remember, because balance sheets have to balance, when you misstate the book debt, you're not including the lease debt. You're also not including the lease asset you created when you signed that lease. A retailer who signs for a lease for a store effectively has that store as an asset for a temporary period, 8, 10, 12 years, but that has to be shown as an asset and you're not doing it. So that's the effect of misclassifying financing expenses or operating expenses. And you're saying, well, how do I clean up for that? Well, the first thing you do is you stop treating operating lease, operating lease expenses as operating expenses. Instead, what you do is you take the contractual commitments you've signed. Remember that lease commitment, the lease contract you signed, two million a year for the next 10 years. You take the present value of those lease commitments for the period that you've signed them for, using the pre-tax cost of borrowing that you face as a company as your discount rate. 
Why pre-tax? Because lease commitments are stated in pre-tax terms. And what you get as a present value is effectively the debt value of leases. That will now show up in your balance sheet as lease debt. Now, when you create lease debt, as I said, you create a lease asset of equivalent amount, a counter asset. Now, when you create a lease asset, you depreciate it. So that depreciation will now show up in your income statement, just like you'd have depreciated land, building and equipment. And if you have debt from leases, you'd have interest expenses, right? That implicit interest expense will now show up in your income statement as an interest expense. So here's what you've effectively done. You've taken that lease expense that you used to treat as an operating expense and replaced it with two items, the depreciation on the leased asset and an interest expense of equivalent amount. In sum, you're subtracting out the same amount still, but where it's going is going to be different because the depreciation is going to show up above the operating income line, affected operating income, but the interest expense on lease debt is going to show up below. What that's effectively going to do is it's going to make your operating income higher than it used to be before you made this adjustment, but it's going to have no effect on your net profit because as I said, you've just replaced one expense with two expenses of equivalent amount. So I worked out what the effects of capitalizing leases or any other financing expense would be on some key accounting statistics of financial ratios. When you capitalize leases or financing expense, you're going to generally correct your operating margin and usually increase it for most companies. Your net margin is not going to be affected. When you compute return on equity, again, because it's net equity and book equity, neither is affected by capitalizing leases, return on equity doesn't change. But return on invested capital will. Why? Because your operating income is now going to get restated. Remember, you broke the lease expense into depreciation and interest expense and only the depreciation expense stays in your operating income. And your invested capital is going to change. You're just saying why? Because invested capital includes book equity plus book debt. And now you're going to bring in the lease debt as part of the debt before you subtract out cash. For most companies, capitalizing leases, especially if they have lots of leases, will decrease the return on capital while increasing the operating margin. And finally, if you compute debt ratios, whether it's book or market, bringing in leases as debt will increase your debt ratio. You will have more debt in the company. Now do you see why capitalizing leases can change your perspective in a company? For decades, until 2019, we were understating debt ratios at retail firms, restaurants, companies with substantial lease commitments. We're understating the debt ratio and understating margins. Got a much more honest perspective of these companies when you capitalize leases. So when you think about accounting inconsistencies, they have consequences. And finally, in 2019, both GAP and IFRS came to their senses and they decided that leases should be treated as debt. Now, they deserve some applause for doing it because they're doing the right thing. But the real question is, why did it take them so long? I've been doing this now, you know, capitalizing leases for about 30 years because I compute things like debt ratios and margins for companies at the start of every year, compute industry averages, and I've never understood the accounting treatment of leases. But there's a broader point I want to make. Think of why lease commitments are like debt. They're contractual commitments. You've got to make them in good times. You've got to make them in bad times. That's why they should be treated as debt. Are there any other contractual commitments a company has that could conceivably meet the same criteria? I think so. I mean, take Netflix. If you have Netflix, you know that some of the content is original content, but some of it is rented content, rented from other studios, other producers. And in return for Netflix being able to show that movie, they commit to making $5 million or $50 million in payments every year for the next five years. And if you look at Netflix's financial statements in the footnotes, in the same footnote that tells you what their lease commitments are, they also give you content commitments. These are the contractual commitments they've entered into for content for future years. I think you should be treating that, that content commitment as debt. Some companies have purchase commitments they enter into, and if those purchase commitments are binding, in other words, you can't back out of them easily, maybe a recession or a down year, then I would treat them as debt as well. So we need to treat financing expenses as financing expenses and not, be tr and not treat them as operating expenses.
There's a second group of expenses that accountants miscategorize. They sometimes treat big capital expenses as operating expenses. Again, I'm going to use a very specific example, the most common one, which is R&D. Remember, the definition of capital expense is it's an expense designed to create benefits over many years, right? And if you use the definition, what's more capex than R&D? It should be super capex. What company in its right mind does R&D expecting to get a benefit in the current year? There is no logic for treating R&D as an operating expense. We'll come back and talk about accounting defenses for why they do what they do. But when you treat R&D as an operating expense, here's what you do. You subtract the entire amount you spend from R&D, from your revenues to get to operating income and to net income. In general, you will understate operating and net income, though I'll tell you cases where that might not be true. But in general, subtracting the entire R&D expense is going to push down both operating and net income. But you have a secondary effect. When you have a capital expense, you create an asset. So when you take a capital expense and you treat it as an operating expense, you've also effectively taken it off your books. It's not going to show up in your balance sheet. So a company that takes R&D and expenses it will show nothing from that R&D on its balance sheet. Which is a lie because if this is the way you grow is by investing billions in R&D, I should be treating it, treating it as an asset because of the amount of capital you've invested. Note, I'm not giving them credit for anything good. I'm just saying you've invested billions in R&D. So when you expense R&D, you're understating income and you're also understating your book value of assets and the book value of equity. So if you correct R&D, here's what's going to happen. First, you're going to bring onto the books an asset. I'm going to call it R&D capital, where you look at the R&D expenses over time and you say, well, this is what's left of that expense today. I'm going to treat it as an asset. And my book equity will go up by, by the same amount. And remember what we said about assets. If you create an asset, you've got to depreciate or amortize it. In this case, I will amortize that R&D asset over the lifetime of R&D. You're saying, what's the lifetime of R&D? Roughly speaking, it's the number of years it takes between the time you do R&D and a commercial product emerges. For a pharmaceutical company, this could be a decade. For a technology company, maybe two to three years. So here's what happens when you correct for the accounting treatment of R&D. First, R&D expenses will disappear from your income statement. You will have an R&D asset on your balance sheet. And, an R, and the book value of equity will increase by that amount. And if you go back to the income statement, you will now see an amortization of R&D show up as an expense. So the net effect on operating a net income will be, you'll take whatever your stated income is, that the accountants told you what it was, you're going to add back the R&D expense, saying I should never have subtracted out, and you're going to subtract out the amortization of R&D. Will your income go up or down? For companies with growing R&D expenses, R&D expenses have grown over time. When you correct for R&D, your income will go up because you're adding back a big R&D expense and you're subtracting out the R&D amortization of R&D expenses from previous years, which were much lower. If you have a company with flat R&D, your R&D is roughly the same every year, you'll have no effect on earnings. And if you have a company with declining R&D, capitalizing R&D, will actually reduce operating income and net income. So when you look at numbers like, op I mean, statistics again, capitalizing R&D will affect your operating and net margins. It'll make them go up for companies with growing R&D. It'll leave them untouched for companies which have flat R&D and decrease them for companies with shrinking R&D. Your return on invested capital and return on equity will both be affected. Why? Because your earnings are getting restated and so is your book equity, if you're looking at return on equity, or your book invested capital. And when you look at debt ratios, your book debt ratios are going to be affected because your book equity is now going to be a higher number. So book debt ratios will decrease when you capitalize R&D, but there will be no effect on market debt to equity ratios or market debt to capital ratios. You're saying, how come? Because remember, the market was already reflecting the value of your R&D in its market capitalization. Markets don't follow accounting rules. They make their own judgments. So you can again see that by not treating R&D as a capital expense, 
you have serious consequences for the income you measure, the book value of capital, the return on capital. In fact, I think one reason technology firms have sky high returns in equity and returns in invested capital with accounting numbers, and they often do, is because your biggest asset is off the books. You've not capitalized R&D. But when we talk about R&D again, we're talking about the tip of the iceberg. If R&D is a capital expense because the benefits flow over many years, there are other expenses that meet that criteria that accountants are now treating as operating expenses. Like what? Exploration costs in an oil company. I mean, remember, if you explore and you find reserves, even if you're lucky, you're not going to get oil from those reserves or coal or whatever the reserves are until four, five, seven years from now. How about advertising costs at a consumer product company directed at building a brand? Let me step back. When you think about a company like Coca-Cola spending money on advertising, some of it is to get you to buy a can of cola today, to get you to buy more of the product. That's traditional operating expense. But some of it is just to build a brand name. Why? Because it's their biggest asset. It's what allows them to grow and have pricing power. So you could argue that a chunk of advertising expenses at consumer product companies are really capital expenses, not operating expenses. What about user and subscri subscriber acquisition costs for a user or subscriber-based company? Companies like Netflix and Uber. If this is the basis for your value of lots of users, lots of subscribers, we should be capitalizing those acquisition costs. Though how, how much of an effect it will have will depend on how long your subscribers or users stay as customers. So if you have a subscriber who once signed stays on as a subscriber for 10 years, the effect is going to be much greater than if your subscribers stay on for only a couple of years. And finally, employee recruiting and training expenses at a consulting firm or any company depend on human capital. You could argue that's really a capital expense. You shouldn't be expensing it. You're saying, if this is true, how come accountants have not come to this realization? I don't mean to say terrible things about accounting, but accounting reflects its history. Its history reflects the fact that the rules of accounting were developed in the 20th century. They were designed for the old-time manufacturing company. We're now taking those rules and we're trying to bend them and morph them to fit technology companies and pharmaceutical companies and service companies and they're not quite working. I know accountants have woken up to how important intangible assets are. They're trying. I'm not, I'm not you know, faulting them for, for, for not trying. They are trying. But I think because of the legacy effects, it's going to take them a long time to do the right thing when it comes to these costs. What does that mean for us? Don't wait for accounting to do the right thing. Do it yourself. So let's talk about why we want to make these corrections because this is work. Right? You're saying, why would I want to spend this time correcting operating income, correcting book value, correcting invested capital? Because whether you're an investor or a trader, investors value companies, traders price companies, miscategorizing expenses can lead to bad consequences. Let's suppose you're an investor, you want to do valuation. Let's, you know, valuation, you can either value just the equity in a business directly, or you can value the entire business. Let's see what happens when you miscategorize a financing expense as an operating expense. Okay? Actually, the arrow should run the other way. A financing expense as an operating expense. If you treat a financing expense as an operating expense, your net income is not affected. You think that's good. It may affect your cost of equity. If your cost of equity reflects the debt ratio of a company, more levered companies have higher cost of equity. But the overall effect on equity will come almost entirely from the cost of equity correction. So treating leases as operating expenses had a relatively small effect if you focused on a dividend discount model or a free cash flow equity model. But if you're valuing the firm, you're taking free cash flow as a firm and discounting at a cost of capital then everything changes, right? Your free cash flows to the firm are going to be different because you've moved an expense from the operating to the financing column. You usually make your free cash flows to the firm go up for most firms. 
you're going to discount it a cost of capital reflects a much higher debt ratio and that can often lower your cost of capital though sometimes if you're over levered it can raise your cost so you have higher cash flows often a lower cost of capital you bring those two together you get a higher value for the firm you think this is amazing this is great but before you celebrate remember you got to subtract out the debt outstanding and when you capitalize leases you got to subtract out that larger debt value and the net effect on equity can be to increase it decrease it or leave it unchanged that's why you need to capitalize leases because it's not a neutral effect it can have an effect and I'm going to argue the effect is real and by not capturing it you're missing something critical if you're doing valuation, you're saying, what's the effect of treating capital expense as an operating expense? If you treat a capital expense as an operating expense, as is the case with R&D, you're misstating your profitability. You're also misstating how much the company is reinvesting. In general, for most firms, when you, when you capitalize R&D, here's what you're going to do. You're going to increase the profitability of the company. That's a good news. But you're also going to increase the reinvestment by roughly the same amount. The effect on cash flows is actually zero because you know whether you move an item into the finance the the cap whether an item is a capital expenditure or an operating expenditure it's still a cash outflow. So you're saying why would I waste my time if the cash flows I get are going to be the same? Because it changes the way you think about how profitable the company is and how much it reinvests because that can have consequences for how much growth you give the company and what the value of that growth is going to be. Remember, growth is driven by how much you reinvest and how well you reinvest. And to answer those questions, you need to capitalize R&D and R&D-like expenses. So there's valuation consequences. And a lot of people don't value companies. They price them. They use price earnings ratios, price to book ratios, you know, equity multiples, or enterprise value multiples, EV to sales, EV to invested capital, EV to EBITDA. You're saying, what will correcting for accounting you know, accounting miscategorization of financing or capital expenses do for me. If you're looking at numbers like price earnings ratios or price to book ratios, it is true. Capitalizing leases will have little or no effect on you unless you want to bring in the amount of debt a company has as a measure of risk. So you might say, look, I want to pick less risky companies. Well, capitalizing leases might allow you to capture that risk. When it comes to, you know, the effect on... Uh, you know, equity multiples when you treat R&D as an operating expense? Well, your net income is going to change, usually go up. Your book equity is going to change, usually go up when you capitalize leases. Well, it's also going to mean that what you compute as a price earnings ratio for a company or a price to book ratio will be different. In fact, they'll often be lower after you capitalize leases. So one reason you've been avoiding technology companies is because the PE ratios look higher and the price to book ratios look higher. You might be right about them being overvalued, but some of that might come from the fact that accountants are not bringing the biggest assets onto the books. What if you're using enterprise value multiples? When you look at multiples like EV to EBITDA or EV to invested capital, capitalizing leases is going to change the invested capital number and the EBITDA number. So you generally find that the EV to EBITDA or EV to invested capital numbers you get for companies will be different when you treat leases as debt. You're saying, so what? Well, they're going to be different across companies. When you're comparing across companies, the, the rankings you get, the choices you make can be affected by the capitalization. And I think you get a much better sense of which companies are cheaper expensive. And if you're using enterprise value multiples and you capitalize R&D, again, operating income is going to change, EBITDA is going to change, invested capital is going to change, every scalar you use for enterprise value will be different. The numerator itself is not, is not going to be affected when you capitalize leases. Whereas in, when you capitalize financing expenses, your numerator is affected. The enterprise value incorporates the additional debt. But with enterprise value multiples, you are again going to get a very rank, different ranking for companies when you capitalize R&D than when you don't. And finally, you value companies. You know, one of the things we'll talk about is how stories matter, right? Ultimately, you're investing or pricing based on a story. And your story for a company can change when you capitalize financing and, and, and R&D expenses. When you capitalize lease expenses, you might find that some of the retailers you used to like because they look good on an accounting basis don't look as good once you capitalize leases. Their return on equity goes from, I'm sorry, their return on invested capital goes from being above the cost of capital to below the cost of capital. 
Same thing when you capitalize R&D. It changes your views about how profitable a company is and how much it's reinvesting. It can change the way you rank companies as investments. So there's good reason to spend the time correcting for accounting mistakes. So now let's talk about Facebook. Facebook, I'm not going to talk about leases because as I said, starting in 2019, it's been capitalized. And second, Facebook even before that was not a big lessor. It's not a, it's not a, it's a, it's not a company with big lease commitments. It's not a big issue, but R&D is. This graph, I show you Facebook's R&D expenses from 2011 through the last 12 months ending September 2022. If you look at the red red column, which is the, which is the R and D expense, you can see that in the last twelve months, Facebook spent almost thirty two point six billion dollars on R and D, making it one of the largest spenders in R and D on the face of the earth. In fact, of the top ten companies spending on R and D, seven are technology companies, two are pharmaceutical companies, and only one is a manufacturing company, Volkswagen. Facebook spends immense amounts on R and D. But there's an added interesting component to this graph. One is if you look at what's happened to that R&D spending over the last four or five years, usually R&D spending tends to decrease as companies scale up. In the case of Facebook, it's actually accelerated in the last five years. So not only is Facebook spending a lot on R&D, the amount it's spending is accelerating. And remember, this R&D actually includes very little of what they're investing in the metaverse. We're going to come back and talk about the metaverse. So this is actually R&D kind of going into the business. Now, what I've done also in this graph is I've capitalized R&D. Remember, I said to capitalize R&D, you need a life. I used a three-year life for R&D and going back in time, using that three-year life, I've created an R&D asset. This is the asset that's going to show up on your balance sheet. And in September of 22, that R&D capital invested was 53.1 billion. Remember, this now gets added to book equity as well. And finally, the blue column tells you how much of the R&D from previous years I'm amortizing in this year. And again, focusing in the last 12 months ending through September 2022, Facebook wrote off about, or should be writing off about $18.9 billion of past R&D invested. So let's step back. Facebook spent $32.6 billion in R&D in the last 12 months. It is writing off $18.9 billion. Remember that difference of about $13 to $14 billion is now the adjustment you're going to make to your earnings. And that is exactly what I've done in this graph is adjusted earnings for that difference between the current R&D expense, which I add back, and the amortization, which I subtract out. And I've corrected the operating income for Facebook going back to 2011. For R&D. Does it make a difference? Yes, absolutely. In the last 12 months, Facebook reported operating income of 35.5 billion, according to the accountants. According, after I've corrected for R&D, that looks like it should be really 49.3 billion. That's a lot of, that's a pretty big difference. The operating margin for Facebook, the last 12 months, was a bit of a disappointment, down to 30% from what it was previously, by 40%. If you correct for R&D, that number jumps to 42%. It's still down about 6 or 7% from last year. But that's a pretty impressive operating margin in a, bad, in a bad year. This is a company that has been immensely profitable through its life. It's had a little bit of a downturn in 2022. We'll talk about why. But R&D, cor correcting for R&D makes a big difference to what you see as margins. Now, the other number that I want to clean up for is what kind of accounting returns. Because remember, the return on capital that a company makes measures the quality of its investments if it's measured right. I've computed the pre-tax return on capital. In fact, I should have mentioned the margins I corrected for in the previous page were pre-tax margins. I've corrected for pre-tax, you know, pre-tax return on capital here. And here again, you can see correcting for R&D pushes up the return on capital from an impressive number to an even more you know, for it, it, it pushes down the return on capital from an impressive number to a still impressive number, but a lower number. Why is it pushing it down? Because while the operating income is increasing, as you saw on the previous page, your invested capital is also going up. You have a bigger base. And this is the effect I talked about. In most years, you can see the return on capital with R&D treated as a capital expense is lower. For Facebook, it's not catastrophic. The return on capital, even with the R&D adjustment, pre-tax is 34%, companies would kill 
for that return on capital. They'd gladly, you know, most companies would switch their return on capital for that one. But there are technology companies where once you make the correction, you discover very quickly that the return on capital is now single digits. It's actually close to or even below the cost of capital. And those are the companies you want to be careful about when they map out plans for growth. Now let's talk about the metaverse. It's the talk of the moment. And I'll be quite honest, I'm a little hazy about what the metaverse is. I see a virtual world where people enter with, you know, Facebook actually bought Oculus 2014 as a precursor to entering this world. And they spend a lot of time in that virtual world. The reason I'm hazy is that's fine, but to make money in this, you've got to figure out a business model. Now, for better or worse, Facebook has made a big jump into the metaverse. In fact, they've renamed themselves based on that entry. And if you look at their last 12 month data, they, they basically in the footnotes break out their investment in the metaverse and what they're generating as revenues right now. It's, in, it's broken out as reality labs. It might not be comprehensive. There might be investments in the R&D that are for the metaverse. It's tough to tell. But let's focus on what reality labs, which houses their virtual reality glasses and their entree into the metaverse, did to earnings in the last 12 months. So this is right out of the financial statement. It tells you what the last quarter. In the last quarter, reality labs had revenues of $285 million and expenses of $3.7 billion. Over the nine months in 2022, you know, expense of 1.4 billion and you know, revenues of 1.4 billion expense. There is no way that these expenses are operating expenses. In other words, you can't tell me that to generate 285 million in revenues, you spend 3.7 billion. You're saying, what's the money then for? My guess is most of this is a capital expense and accountants are categorizing it as an operating expense. In fact, what I did was I actually took the operating income that I got before and after the R&D correction and asked the question, what would have, what did these numbers have looked like if Reality Labs did not exist? So you take out the effect of Reality Labs, your revenues are lower by about 2.3 billion. Now I'm talking with the R&D correction, with the, no, with the R&D correction. So I'm sorry, that should be with the R&D correction, not without. So cross out the out. But take a look at what would have happened to my operating income. My operating income, which is 49.3 billion, already increased by how I treated by the capitalization of R&D jumps to almost 62 billion. You thought the operating margin of 41.7% was impressive. Take a look at what it would have been without the metaverse investment, 53.5 billion. And again, I'm not trying to talk you into buying Facebook or out of it, but here's why I think it matters. If you treat metaverse the way it should be treated, that drop in operating and net margins that you saw in the last 12 months should not be read to mean that the operating business, the online advertising business is somehow melting down. It's not, it's still a cash cow, a tremendous money machine. It just reflects the fact that Facebook is making big bets on R&D and, and on the reality labs. Second, if you're doing pricing, I mean, let's take price earnings ratios. At the time that I at the time that I'm doing this session, Facebook's market cap is about 250 billion. And if you trust the accountants, the net income is about 29 billion. You divide 250 by 29, you come up with a PE ratio of about eight, eight, a little bit more than eight, maybe 8.5, 8.3, 8.4. It's pretty low, right? But if you correct the net income, remember the 29 billion in net income, you'd be adding about the same adjustment you did to the operating income. Your adjusted net income is going to jump to 43 billion. You divide 250 billion by 43 billion, you get a PE ratio of six. Again, I'm not trying to tell you Facebook is cheap. I don't use PE ratios to pick stocks, but if you use PE ratios or EV to EBITDA multiples, to find out what's cheap and what's expensive, and you're comparing Facebook to Coca-Cola or Navistar or, um, or a manufacturing company, you're comparing apples to oranges if you use accounting earnings. I think you need to clean up the earnings and then make your own judgment whether you'd buy Facebook at six. Because from a valuation perspective, I'm not saying that the metaverse investments don't matter, the cash outflows obviously, but the value effect will depend on what you think the payoff will be from those investments. Right now, you know what I see? 
I see at least in the market, investors basically saying nothing will come from this investment. Not even low cash flows. They're basically saying this is money down the drain. And it's a pretty cynical view of investing $10 billion in the most recent year. And at least according to plans, $100 billion over the next 10 years. But investors seem to believe that this is going to be wasted money. They don't trust Facebook on this. And you know who I blame? I blame the company. Because I've been looking over what the company has said about the metaverse, and I see almost no mention of a business model. What am I talking about? Hey, let's assume that we all buy Facebook uh, virtual reality glasses. We put them on, and we spend half our lives in the metaverse. Hey, for Facebook to make money, it's got to figure out a business model for the metaverse, right? Is it going to charge us a subscription for being in this virtual world? Maybe it's going to be transactions where you buy things, virtual things in the virtual world. Or maybe it's an extension of their advertising model. And Facebook has been remarkably remiss in filling in the details. In fact, that is going to be the topic for my next post, is they seem to have just lost the script. They've been actually very open about how much they plan to spend on the metaverse. In other words, they've given us all the bad news. But in a strange way, they don't want to fill in the rest of the details. They're very, being very opaque about what the upside here is. So take what you might out of the session. But what I would strongly recommend that you do is start treating expenses the way they should be. Start cleaning up for accountants. Not because you're a nitpicker, but because your investment judgments are being driven by these numbers. And you want to make sure, especially if you're comparing across companies or making assessments of value, that you're using numbers that reflect the true profitability, the true reinvestment, the true debt ratios or risk in a company. And right now, we're not getting that picture when we look at accounting statements. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you found the session useful.